breaking the wall of understanding the quantum world, how ultra-cold atoms allow us to explore the secrets of the quantum universe. Immanuel Bloch, Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. On November 9, 1989, as a 16-year-old preparing for final exams, I often visited the Rhön with American guests to show them the dividing line between East and West Germany. It felt surreal that we can now cross it so easily, a stark contrast to the unease we once felt near the border. So good afternoon, everybody. Do you have parents that call you every second day to ask what's up? I, I do. And actually, what's pretty curious, they're not physicists, but actually they want to know what's going on in the lab even. Every, so it's hard to keep up with that. But what I find actually quite remarkable you know, is uh, they're interested in this, what's going on. And by now, they pretty much have a good idea what I'm doing. But in the beginning, it was a little bit uh, challenging to explain to them what I'm doing. When I talk to my professional colleagues, I say I'm a quantum physicist, and I try to work on understanding quantum many-body systems. Uh, that's not really helpful, right? So I try to make a, a little bit better analogy what's going on. So I try to say, OK, I'm like a sociologist, but for quantum. So what does a sociologist do for humans? Tries to predict human behavior given the rules of engagement. And the last few days we've seen that's really hard to predict what's coming out of that, right? And in the quantum world, we try to do the same things. There, the rules of engagement are very clear. We know the rules of physics, how particles interact. They're very strict rules, much better than between humans, very well known. But still, there are many unknowns in the outcomes. But they're very beautiful things that come out of this, our universe. Uh, neutron stars, materials, superconductors, metals, semiconductors, fantastic complex molecules. And we all try to understand these, why these materials or why these systems have the properties they have. What do we have to do? How do we bring these systems together, these atoms, to form a specific object like that one? And that's what we try to do when we speak about quantum many body systems. And uh, actually, Jürgen, where are you, Jürgen? You're also a quantum many-body system. But Jürgen is just too complex for me to even try to try my tools on. So we're not going to try to analyze Jürgen. So there's an incredible opportunity for scientific discovery here. And uh, you know, trying to see what we can build out of rigid rules, strict rules, but putting things together. What can emerge? Now, you could say, why don't we just calculate this on a computer? We have fantastic computers. And there's something comes in that I would like to explain to you. In the quantum world, it's not so easy. So let's just take a classical computer, your magnetic hard drive. And let's say this is, consists of small magnets. And if your hard drive is nothing's on it, everything is set to 0. And your magnets point like this. Everything's 1. Magnets point like that. And if there's some data stored on your computer, obviously the magnets point in a certain pattern of zeros and ones on your computer. But it's just one pattern of zero and ones, right? There's just one information stored on your computer. Not so in the quantum world. In the quantum world, actually, you can have superpositions. You can be simultaneously be in different configurations. That's the Schrödinger cat thing. You heard about that, right? dead and alive at the same time. Here it means many configurations at the same time. How many configurations? Well, actually, it turns out that it gets pretty large, this number. It's like the rice corn game of exponential growth on the chessboard. You know, if we only have 64 particles, we just have so many configurations that we cannot keep track of them, even on the most powerful computers today. So this quantum complexity, as we call it, really challenges us using classical computing hardware to address these problems. So if we can't you know, calculate, why can't we just look inside to the material and try to understand what the hell is going on? What are these electrons, for example, in this superconductor actually doing? That's also very difficult. You heard this morning, actually, you have to build very sophisticated devices, these synchrotrons, these big machines, to look in this tiny material on the left. That's the material. The scales are really tiny. The distances between the atoms are one millionth of the thickness of a human hair. So we have to build very new light sources, short wavelengths, very complex machines to look into these systems. So why not try something else? Why not try to scale this thing up by a factor of 10,000, for example? Then we're suddenly in n at length scales where I can just conveniently look into it with an optical microscope. Well, if you try to pull on a real material and try to stretch it, that's not going to work, right? It's just going to break. And that's what real materials do. So let's try to do something different. Let's try to build a material which does not consist of, you know, atoms bound together by themselves, but let's try to make a crystal of light. 
And we just do that by interfering laser beams on top of each other. And when these laser beams overlap, they form these patterns of bright and dark spots of light. And we can actually trap atoms in these crystals of light. And we configure these crystals of light in very different ways and hold atoms, material particles, just by the forces of light. And I'm just going to show you a picture in a second how that works. This has a lot of advantages. Things are now scaled up, so you can really look into it. I'll show you pictures of that. And actually, at the same time, motion is slowed down. So my colleague Ferenc Krauss, who's actually also here. Ferenc, where are you? Are you here? He was here. OK, there's Ferenc. He does that with attosecond pulses. He tries to understand the electron motion in real solids. But here, everything is dramatically slowed down. But always, there's no free lunch. We always have to pay some price. Things don't get too good in nature. So the price we have to pay, we actually have to cool the system down to absolute zero temperature, very close to absolute zero temperature, which means we have to bring the atoms that, or the molecules that are buzzing around us with hundreds of meters to a standstill, almost to a standstill, where they approach these temperatures. So I want to show you this picture, this movie, from my PhD advisor, Ted Hench, uh, where he actually shows the first, the trapping, how we can trap with light. So we take a few laser beams, OK? We overlap them. Uh, we have interference. You'll see the interference pattern in a second. So first we see two laser beams interfering. This gives this bright and dark stripes of two laser beams. And we can do that with uh, four laser beams. It gives us a more complex crystal pattern of the light field. And now we're going to, what he's going to do, he's going to take small plastic beads, dissolve them in water, and just shine the pattern of light onto these plastic beads. Okay, so it's just small plastic beads in water now. And now we just turn on the light. Do you see how they want to align along the light lines? So the light really wants to align them. The light is like a potential landscape for the atoms, which they lock into, or the kind of plastic beads in this case. Let's just have a look for the 2D case. You see how they lock into this light, light pattern? There's nothing else. It's just the immaterial light that locks them into place and allows us to trap them. How do we cool? How do we get to these super cold temperatures? That's actually also challenging because we have no fridge that can cool to these super, super low temperatures. And we actually do that with light. And here's a picture of the comet Hale-Bopp, which I guess many of you might not know him anymore, but that was a famous comet in 1997, which passed the Earth. It was a very bright one. And the dust of that comet, the tail, always points away from the sun because the sun exerts a force through the light field onto that dust particles. So light is like a wind that blows on those particles. We don't feel this light. I don't feel this light pushing on me right now. It makes me sweat, maybe, but it doesn't push on me. But, but for the comet, you can really see there's a material uh, force acting onto that. And if we do that with lasers, if you take laser beams and shine them from all different directions, this light force is so intense, this wind is so intense, that you can stop, the, bring the atoms to a standstill immediately by pointing the atoms in such a way that the wind always blows against their motional direction. And the acceleration or the deceleration they experience is 10,000 times the acceleration of Earth. You know, we humans can withstand maybe 5G, maybe a fighter pilot 10G. This is 10,000 G that the atom experiences and immediately comes to rest, is stopped and cooled. And then we can trap them. And here's a picture now of these atoms, individual atoms, that we can now see. We can shine light on them. We can make them fluoresce. We can see them light up in these crystals of light. And they light up like, like small light bulbs. And each small blue dot that you see here is just an individual atom held in this immaterial crystal of light. So uh, you might wonder, oh, I told you before, there's this, isn't this in the, shouldn't this be a superposition? In quantum mechanics, you have superposition of configurations. Uh, that's true, but there comes another thing you should learn about quantum mechanics. Whenever you look on a quantum system, you always only get one result. You only see one of the configurations. Yeah, it's like a lottery. You don't know which of the configurations you're going to get in a single shot, in a single photograph of the system, but you're going to get one. So you have to repeat the experiment many, many times, and then you can get probabilities of different configurations. And out of these probabilities of configurations, we can tell something about the material properties on really a microscopic scale. So there's another wonderful technique that actually a colleague of mine and a friend of mine, Antoine Beauvais, in Paris actually introduced. This is kind of using the same ideas of using light to trap atoms by just focusing a laser beam onto an atom. We call this an optical tweezer. And you can put these optical tweezers in very, very different pattern and load individual atoms, hold them into these uh, different focused light beams, like a tractor beam, like the Star Wars tractor beam. You remember that? That's that for light, using light. It just attracts the particles into the focus of the laser beam. 
And by you know, steering those laser beams around into different places, you can arrange any possible configuration you want. And you know, just for fun, he even made three-dimensional patterns that you can see on the right, and a beautiful Eiffel Tower made out of single atoms in three dimensions, placing these atoms in arbitrary configurations. So right now, we're working on exploiting these, you know, trying to understand material properties uh, with these systems. We're scaling this up. Let me just show you a recent picture from the lab where we're going up to 10,000s of particles in those lattices, really large systems now for, for us, not for real materials, but these are large enough to uh, analyze real material problems. We can change the geometry of the system, the interactions, the dimensionality, all without synthesizing a new material. You know, and for a, chem for a real material scientist, you always have to synthesize a new material to, to check its properties. And here you can do basically everything by just continuously tuning those parameters. We're also learning how to load those atoms and uh, move them with these tweezers in these lattices. So I show you this small movie where we kind of, on the left-hand side, you see these randomly appearing single atoms blinking. And then we take this tweezer and move it into a predetermined position on the right-hand side. And this is the array that we can build up on the right-hand side. Sometimes an atom on the right gets lost in our vacuum chambers. Then we know, we take an image where one got lost, we pick up just another one and replace the atom in that position. So these are really new techniques, I think, which will be groundbreaking for quantum computing, quantum simulation, and also quantum metrology, something you'll hear about in June's talk later. So let me just connect this to, to quantum computing, something you've all also heard about. Actually, these are very similar systems that people try to implement, implement both simulation and computing approaches. In simulation, as I showed you, we try to build up a synthetic version of the real material. The advantage is, you know, if we have a small imperfection, it doesn't really matter so much because nature is robust. Small imperfections don't change our world so dramatically. Otherwise, we wouldn't be around. If we would have small changes and everything would change catastrophically, we wouldn't be here. So nature is robust, and this helps us in this approach. But it's not universal. We can only, of course, simulate whatever we can build in the lab. Now, in quantum computing, you try to follow a different approach. You try to, you know, have a universal computer that can calculate anything, but this thing cannot tolerate errors. You have to be absolutely precise. If you have one error, the whole calculation is wrong. That's why people are spending so much time on trying to find ways to correct errors in this approach. So this is universal, but at the same time resource hungry. And now in the world, there's a great effort uh, going through different systems, ion traps, the optical lattices, Rydberg tweezers, superconducting systems, that both approaches are followed and hand in hand developments are going together in advancing these systems. Let me just connect to a talk you'll hear later today this afternoon by, by Jun, Jun Ye from Boulder. Uh, he will show you actually how you can do very, very precise timekeeping with these atoms in those optical lattices. So you'll see similar systems. And for a physicist, the clock is nothing than a pendulum and just counting how many times this pendulum goes from left to right. So of course, we don't use mechanical pendula anymore today, but we use better pendula. And the pendula we use today are these atoms in the lattices where we can excite the electron clouds in the lattices to oscillate back and forth, unperturbed. Each atom oscillates in its electron cloud, and we pick up the beat, the, the motion of those um, electron clouds in our systems to basically measure time. And June will tell you more about that, and I'll highly encourage you to, to listen to his talk. So let me finish and in showing you that really it's wonderful today because we have basically a quantum universe in the lab. We can study quantum many-body systems in all their different incarnations with aspects that pertain to our universe, neutron stars, quantum materials, um, particle physics, and all do that you know, basically in small lab-scale experiments, learning about the wonderful ways how nature behaves and what wonderful kind of quantum phases of matter we can realize in nature that might not even have been realized in real materials before, and that can give us guidance how to actually realize in real materials. So I want to finish with this quote actually from Erwin Schrödinger, you know, in, uh, one of the fathers of quantum mechanics with Werner Heisenberg. And he, he, in 1952, so quite a bit later than when he invented quantum mechanics, he said, like, it is absolutely imperceivable for us to ever experiment with single particles like these single atoms, just as likely as it is imperceivable for us to raise ichthyosauria in the zoo. Well, I hope the first part I showed you is pretty clear we're doing that now. Uh, we're doing that to a really large scale. The second one hasn't realized yet, but I wouldn't be so sure about that one either. Yeah? So, so it shows <coughs> how, how science can advance, how science is moving on and giving us wonderful possibilities in exploring nature. And these quantum simulators throughout the labs in the world are giving us fantastic new opportunities to do that. Thank you.